All right, everyone, welcome back to the final panel of CIE. Today's the last day. Happy Canada Day to everyone. And here we're starting with the last panel, which is broadcasting, production, and graphic design. With me are four special guests in the industry and here to answer questions about um, anything related to broadcast, production, or graphic design. So starting off, we can introduce yourselves. I have two questions for everyone. You can ask, you can answer them both at the same time or individually. So I want you to introduce yourself your name, what do you do in the industry, how'd you get to it? And then the second question is, what's your current favorite game right now? Just as an icebreaker. So we can start um, chronologically. So Kayla, Jackie, Joseph, then Don. All right. Um, so my name is Kayla, or my in-game name is Kale. Um, my current role in the industry is as an in-game observer, typically for Valorant, but I also do producing for whatever games are available. Um, I did start out in collegiates and then from there learned or started picking up some volunteer positions and then eventually worked into some paid positions. And now I just work freelance and occasionally for the school when we have collegiate tournaments and stuff. Uh, oh, and my current game uh, is uh, Valorant. Yeah. Uh, yeah, hi, my name is Jackie. Uh, my IGN is Luigi. Uh, I kind of started uh, in high school when I was like in grade 11. I tried running a high school esports club at my high school, failed. And I tried again the year after and I also failed uh, due to like bureaucracy and stuff. But through it, it kind of like got me into uh, like now, like I ended up reaching out to some other friends in like other schools who are also starting esports clubs in high school. Um, like, like I met a guy named Brandon through that. And then together we, uh, through this thing called Vaughn Esports, were doing a bunch of volunteer unpaid, paying for our own po out of pocket actually for a um, bunch of events, got some experience doing broadcasts and observing through that. And then uh, eventually I started doing League Cinematic Observing for uh, the unified League of Legends Proving Grounds qualifiers. like. I think it was like 2021 spring. I don't remember. Anyways, since then, um, I've carried it over to Collegiate and now I'm the student director of broadcast for uh, Waterloo Esports. And I've also worked with Waveform as an intern uh, for four months. And my favorite game right now is just League of Legends. Cool. I guess I'm next. Hey guys, I'm Joseph. Uh, I'm a broadcast producer with uh, Waveform. Your mic cut out, I think. Yeah, I think your mic cut out real quick. Sorry. Not hearing anything. Where all my classmates were jocks and sports guys oh. and gals. And I was like one of the only esports people in, in that program. Uh, and I was just lucky enough to be at the right place at the right time doing stuff with Ryerson, the, the esports club. When I got there, there wasn't really much esports going around. So I just wanted to get some stuff going. And really, everything just started at a grassroots level. Like we were just doing Smash at the at the Smash Club. With just a laptop and a webcam and whatever equipment we can get our hands on and i was super lucky to meet the guys at waveform and they had just started that company and i've been doing that basically since 2018 so almost the last like four and a half years i've been an esports producer i'm super grateful i've been able to travel around the world and do all these cool shows and meet cool people like jackie and all you guys and yeah I'm super grateful to be here and I guess my favorite game right now for sure has to be Counter-Strike. And I'm super excited for Counter-Strike 2 as well. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Don. So basically, uh, I'm a graphic designer. Over the last maybe five, six years, I've been doing graphics for like a bunch of clubs, uh, mainly TMU Esports. But before that, even, uh, I used to do posters for my uh, high school's uh, Dungeons & Dragons club, Big Nerd. But uh, that really just led me up to uh, where I am now. I previously worked with, um, I was employed by FaZe Clan and ended now with TMU. And now I'm just a freelance uh, graphic designer. So uh, my current favorite game right now is Final Fantasy 16. Go buy it uh, if you have a PS5. Um, that's pretty much it about me. All right, yeah, perfect. It was great um, seeing everyone's background. And just as an introduction question, I want to know, how did everyone get into the space? How did you get your first opportunity? And what was it like getting into, you know, the esports and gaming industry? And anyone can jump ahead. Uh, I guess I can start first. So 
Um, I guess my first transition from uh, just doing like volunteer self run events to doing uh, like my first few paid gigs was um, I something that I really got into early in like my observing was I remember I saw this one LEC clip um, where there was like a replay where they had they had like the, the a camera follow the volley bear alts jump on someone and then like um, just kill them and I thought like oh that was really cool so I and I kind of like wanted to figure out how they did that so that led me down to learning this thing called league director um, and then which was what they used to do like cool scripted cinematic shots just uh, in like League of Legends replays and um, by learning that and then getting a little bit of experience uh, doing cinematics with those um, I was able to get a like I applied when I applied for an observing position at Unified's Proving Grounds, they uh, just let me in basically because almost nobody else knows how to do that stuff. Um, so it was I it was, for me it was kind of like I learned like a niche skill in observing that helped me really get into doing paid gigs, and I did observing for like a year. Yep, if anyone has anything else to add. Um, Who's next, Benson? I guess I can go next. Uh, so I guess in a way similar to Jackie, I had, I started out as a streamer and I noticed that my school was hiring for a broadcast producer. And one of the like job title or like recommendations requirements was like, have your own stream with a like consistent stream schedule. And I was like, Okay, sure, I'll apply. Um, at that point, I had never observed anything before. I go into the interview, I try to observe for the first time, and it went really badly, but nobody else applied, so I got the job. And from there, I put a lot of work to get like a lot of practice, so I was reaching out to anybody, like scrims, anything where I could just practice for either I started out in League, but then specialized in Valorant. From there, I found out about um oh my gosh what's this called like a women's and marginalized genders community for valorant and they were doing like in houses where they allowed you to practice your own skills so i found a mentor they coached me throughout a lot of stuff and then that was how i started to get a lot of gigs i did a lot of free stuff signed with an org as a producer while still working collegiate and then just kept like finding more people networking more finding more gigs available and just kept finding stuff to observe and produce. And it's been probably about two and a half to three years by now of doing that. Yeah. Um, I guess I can, I can go next. Um, go oh, sorry. Do you want to go or? Okay, I'll go. Oh, go ahead, um, go ahead. Uh, so basically first working with TMU Esports, I was doing a bunch of you know free stuff for the club. Um, and I kind of needed some pocket money and you know, graphic design is kind of like an easy way to, you know, kind of make money for yourself uh, working with other people. So at first I was just kind of working with anyone on Twitter and a lot of actual uh, VTubers or streamers making uh, graphics and logos for them. And then over time, you know, I built up my skills and uh, I got to do bigger stuff. So recently I've done things with uh, C-Val, Collegiate Valorant, did their whole um, summer showdown uh, overlays and everything about that um, and then uh, you'll soon get into the actual paid roles so uh, through some connections uh, Benson here Club W got me into FaZe Clan which is actually a big W um, I did work with them for a few months not anymore but um, I am doing freelance stuff right now and um, you know building up to that point where you know I can make this work for me um, it's pretty nice, uh, but it did take a, a long time to kind of build up a portfolio and uh, connections. And that's kind of just where I'm at now. Yeah, and I guess for me, like I mentioned, uh, I was doing a lot of stuff with the Smash Club and it was a super guerrilla style stream that we were doing there. It was every Friday, like just with our laptop that we had that was shared with whatever webcams, whatever headset we could get. And we were doing that for a few weeks with like a lot of success for the time, like getting a decent amount of viewers like every single week. And just over time, I started to network and just meet people in Toronto. And I just begged one of my friends to introduce me to uh, Salil Gupta from well, from Waveform. 
who everybody in Toronto, I feel like, knew about if you're trying to do esports broadcasting. And he was, I was super lucky. He gave me the opportunity just to be a production assistant at uh, EGLX 2016 or 2017, I want to say. And I was just basically a stage manager, wrapping cables, cleaning up, like doing whatever needed to be done and just make a good impression, basically, just from just working hard and really, really loving the games. And the rest is history. You just kind of start doing whatever is needed and meeting people and showing what your skills are. And eventually it'll kind of lead to more opportunities. Yeah, perfect. I think the one thing that everyone mentioned was the word skills, which is transitions me to the next question, which are, what are some essential skills in each of your roles? For example, where are the essential skills in observing, graphic design, producing, that led you into, you know, your position? Um, I guess I can start. I think the main thing with observing is attention to detail, and then turning that into memorizing patterns. At the end of the day, the more that you practice, players are going to do the same type of thing, and you just have to recognize those things that you're able to capture them on screen. But other than like networking so that you can get more gigs, but like, I'd say like attention to details, number one. Yeah, I think for observing, it's really just a matter of like the pattern recognition. Um, a lot of things in every game start to become like constants, like uh, I guess from a League of Legends analogy, um, teams start to set up for Dragon around the same time. Um, they start like clearing wards. Uh, ganks are all just like a jungler walking to a lane, and then you kind of just follow the gank and you see what happens or what doesn't happen. Um, so kind of and. Uh, a lot of champion for me, at least specifically doing cinematic observing, like when I was taking replays or when I was taking um, like cool shots, like the things that you want to highlight uh, typically become kind of like pick from like this list of things that happened in this fight, which ones was like the most impactful. Those are the ones you need to highlight. So um, it really is just like getting the reps in and then uh, kind of figuring out which parts of it are what you need to focus on and which parts. Uh, kind of don't don't need to be highlighted as much in the replay and you kind of kind of just like gloss it over um i'd say for graphic design um versatility is like a big uh, important skill you should have just with um you know graphic design you you can always think of it as you know just a picture but um there's things you can always um adapt to or know how to design for like logos or actually printing for apparel or actual like printing out or even this like motion design. So just being able to, you know, have a diverse skill set to apply to that graphic design and to apply it everywhere else is a really important skill set. And I feel like for, for my job, being a producer, it's such like a buzzword now because producer could mean like so many different things. And I just feel like nowadays with OBS and all these and just how far like computers and streaming has come, a producer can just be anybody who produces something could be a stream could be a graphic or whatever but just having skills like video editing photoshop uh like i said obs knowing how it works inside and out um technical stuff like knowing how hardware works like cameras and things like that these are all skills that anybody can learn on the internet really easily and you can even practice at home like like Kay kaylee was saying uh, like you can have your own stream and just do your stream just because someone asks you hey do you have a stream you can set it up instantly when you go home. If you have a PC and a webcam, you can just learn OBS, boot it up. It's super, super easy to, to learn. And I actually have a friend who told his coworkers at the Toronto Raptors that he can he can do OBS, he can do a live stream, no problem. And now he's doing like the post game stream with all the uh, the Raptors commentators just from his laptop and the equipment they've given him. So I would say like OBS is a super important tool to learn. But like I mentioned, video editing and Photoshop they really help a lot. Yeah, perfect. It's amazing to see how you guys all started just learning these skills and applying to your real um, work. And a common thing that a lot of people ask is like, what's the most frustrating and difficult part of being in your role? Like, what are some really nasty pet peeves that you guys keep encountering? Um, dealing with pro players. <laughs> um, because I think for being an observer, my I am the like that middleman between the producer and the players. So trying to get the players into the lobbies and 
making sure they understand how production works like no you can't start the game until the producers are ready and things like that that would be like a number one pet peeve um but anything frustrating is probably going between different levels of players but i can talk about that a little bit later yeah, yeah uh, i can go next on this um I think a lot of these jobs are almost glorified customer service jobs at one point. <laughs> um, a lot with the uh, creative, uh, sorry, just graphic design in general is uh, clients. Not that pe the people are bad, it's just how to, you know, display uh, what you want. And sometimes people can't uh, essentially communicate uh, what they want or what they need. And when you do show them something that, you know, they technically asked for, but you technically didn't understand them, it can get really difficult. and it's just yeah like you said a big pet peeve is just the communication between others for my field especially just um just trying to understand people to make sure what i put out is the right for them and what they wanted always so yeah i don't i don't think i have any particularly large pet peeves um at least in my experience doing broadcasts and observing like, I could say, like, oh, when things go wrong, it's annoying. Uh, but, like, when things go wrong, it's always annoying. So, uh, yeah, I don't really have much to add here. I would say my biggest pet peeve, I instantly I knew what I was going to say, but, and I'm sure everybody in this call has dealt with this before, but if you're working in esports, you're going to come across people, whether it's your clients or just somebody you've hired for some job who you know doesn't know anything about esports or doesn't play any games or just doesn't, watch games or, or even care about games and unfortunately we're just going to have to deal with that in, in this industry because it's still so young and so small and there's not enough people to have all these jobs who play games all night like like we do for example but uh it's just something you have to deal with and you have to learn how to to work with these people and most people are interested in esports and they like it but they might not be as passionate as we are and sometimes that can get in the way of of your show or whatever whatever it is but it's just something we have to kind of push through for the for now until esports grows a little bit more i'd say yeah and a really common thing that a lot of people ask especially now that as you mentioned esports is becoming more of a limited kind of you know industry where a lot of people try to get part of it but they don't know how do esports work um how do you get from i'm pretty sure all of you have done volunteer work in the past how have you gone from volunteer work to paid is there kind of a transition period that you noticed or are there any kind of advice you would give to someone trying to get from volunteer to paid work? Um, usually when I'm, so I guess one thing I didn't mention in my intro is I did work for Cloud9 in their training grounds where I would teach people how to observe or produce and build skills. And one thing that I always told them was like, make sure you know and you are confident in your ability to perform these skills and then slowly try to find like Discord servers, for example, with production where they're like, we need a producer, we need an observer. And if you look at the pay and it's like very little and you feel like I'm confident to do my skills unpaid, try to go for a paid gig if it's like a very low stakes one. And then there you go. That's $15 for a few hours of work and just like slowly build up on that until you're like confident and you know and by networking people will know like oh um yep they've done this and then they can vouch for you to make sure that like they trust you for other gigs but like that's kind of how you transition from unpaid to paid it might be different in other areas yeah the transition is definitely just starting from the bottom and then working your way up there are a number of discords that are great for getting your foot into either unpaid or like volunteer or like um kind of like entry level paid ones where it's like they'll pay you like 20 bucks for a show or whatever um broadcast lgg is the first one that comes to mind and then there are a couple more for like specific games like valorant tolerant i know is popular for valorant um but like being in those servers you you can come across a lot of uh unpaid opportunities you kind of pick and choose which ones uh fit and work for you and the more gigs you do, not only is it like the better you get, um, the more confident you get, but you also just kind of like meet new people. Um, you get a little bit better at like networking and like talking to other people. Um, you might learn a thing or two from them and whether they have more opportunities in the future or if you just need like examples of your previous work, like um, 
kind of doing that volunteer or like starting at the bottom and then just uh, working your way up, uh, it gives you a really good baseline so that when eventually you do see something, some opportunity that's like, oh, come apply for a job. We're looking for casters. We're looking for observers. We're looking for producers. You'll have like a baseline uh, portfolio and uh, some like people that you could point to and be like, yeah, I worked for them and I did this show. Uh, to add on, um, just from my kind of um, career path, um, that whole transition period is a little hard just because as, as a designer, you kind of have to start selling yourself publicly. Um, so I started doing that through Twitter. Um, I, I I had a lot of like side gigs to try to get some small money. Uh, uh, for example, I had a Redbubble account. I'd sell like anime stickers for a few years. <laughs> uh, so just, yeah, just building all up and, you know, taking low pay work, you know, it's fine for the moment, but yeah, obviously um, you do want more and you will get more in the future. And for me, that did take a bit. Uh, also just like um, branding yourself, marketing yourself, uh, specifically uh, specifically uh, having a, a really good portfolio uh, and just, you know, really showcasing yourself, making yourself uh, make sure you're out there for people to see and that you're known. Yeah, I would say if you're a student or whatever, you just have a lot of free time on your hands, uh, do whatever volunteer work you can get your hands on. Keep an eye out for opportunities everywhere. Even put yourself out there and just DM people out of the cold and just say, hey, like, I can do this. These are my skills. Like, I'd love to do this. Show them an example or even just make something for them without even asking. Just, just show it to them. Say, hey, this is what I made for you. You can take it. I'd like to do more with you. You don't, you don't have to use it if you don't like um, but just keep being persistent. If you really want to work in esports, it's it's going to be a while. You might have to do volunteer stuff for for a long time without pay. Um, it's tough for some people, you know, you pay rent and, and things like that. But if you really really want to be here, it's it's going to be a, a long haul. But um, just keep an eye out for paid opportunities everywhere. Like I know people who've gotten jobs on like LinkedIn, for example, in esports, which is at the beginning it wasn't something I, a place where I thought you could get an esports job. Like I thought LinkedIn was for like boomers and old people, but Apparently, those boomers and old people are looking to hire people like us, and they're putting that on LinkedIn. Um, for example, like I got one of my first jobs in esports. My very first job was at uh, Cineplex World Gaming. They were just doing like online tournaments, and I was just like a tournament admin. But that gave me such a great in to esports. Like I met so many people. I met broadcast people. I met tournament people. All all sorts of different uh, esports industry people just from this one job. And I found that job on just like Indeed or one of those like career websites. So keep your eye out for opportunities everywhere and they might be in places that you don't expect. Something I want to add on that actually was that I think is a really good point. was like the personal branding, having uh, a sort of active Twitter or um, just like making sure that um, whatever social media that you do have or that you're using to interact with the esports space is like um, kind of like well-maintained and not, uh, you know, super, childish or uh like a big red flag like being able to present yourself uh in a way that makes you look like a good person and um uh like putting yourself out there either just by like talking to people or like replying to tweets things like that um is a really good way for uh for people who are looking into you um when you like apply to their positions or like when you reach out and say hi i want to work for you um like tracking people's Twitter and stuff like that is like a really good first step that a lot of people go through to look at, oh, what have you been doing? Like, how active are you? Um, and if your Twitter looks good uh, and you're like somewhat active or even if you're not active, but you just have like sort of like a slow record of your shows just on your Twitter, like it is very helpful. Um, that personal branding is something that does go a long way. You want to make sure that, you know, you look good no matter where you are. Um, and yeah, like cold DMing, even on like LinkedIn or whatever, fun fact, I got my internship at Waveform by just DMing Salil on LinkedIn. And then, um, we had like an interview shortly after, so it does work. Um, people in esports are a lot nicer than you would expect. If you are looking for advice, if you're looking for, uh, a job, if you're looking for like, kind of like a direction to go, you can just DM most people and they'll be able to help you in some way maybe they don't get you like an actual job but they can like point you in the right direction they can sometimes they'll keep you in mind if like other things come up everyone is very helpful everyone has been in that position where you kind of like started from nothing so um you know don't be afraid to shoot your shot or just like 
ask around for for things. Great, perfect. And then on to the next question. So let's just say if I had a lot of money, you know, laying around, are there any pieces of equipment or technology that you recommend that people start out with in your respective field? Just a good computer? Yeah, um, a gaming you, PC for sure. Yeah. A place with Ethernet, basically. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, specifically for me, uh, just like a, an ultra-wide monitor is really helpful just for editing um especially for video editors i i think uh just having that wide timeline is really nice uh macro pads for you know key bindings whatever shortcuts whatever you want to do just things that actually help your productivity work better um even more specific to me a, a, a drawing tablet even though i don't use it that much um there's things yeah things that help you uh, do your productivity better um that make you you know work better more comfortably is it's pretty pretty much that is a good point to start uh, but you know what i want to just quickly add in there you mentioned benson like if you have a lot of money like what should you buy and if you have a lot of money you can just buy the best equipment of, of, of everything best webcam best pc but honestly just use what you got like like i keep mentioning that the smash club that i did at, at ryerson but like we just had it was somebody's old laptop like their third laptop like hand me down like we just use that and we just use whatever webcam we could get like wh whatever whatever works for you and whatever you have on hand you should just go with it and you know over time you can upgrade your your setup a little bit and it, it'll be obvious of what you need like you know you can always have a better camera you can always have a faster computer that can process things faster or do the stream at a higher quality but just use what you got and uh don't don't worry about having to spend or break the bank just to have a good stream you can have a good stream with whatever you have already i'm pretty confident yeah, and what are some essential tools that you guys use on a daily basis that you think everyone in your field should be using? OBS. <laughs> yeah, for sure. OBS. Not, not Streamlabs OBS, OBS, guys. <laughs> no. That's yeah, whatever OBS, OBS you're, you're comfortable with, but you can learn OBS super easily. There's a lot of YouTube tutorials. People have made hundreds and thousands of tutorials out there for every little plugin, every, every feature of OBS. Beyond that, I mean, if you start looking into like specific games or specific aspects of broadcast, um, something that's a little more common for people who are doing producing specifically or technical directing would be vMix, uh, but that one gets expensive really fast. Um, but it is kind of like the freelance standard almost for uh, doing technical directing work um, and like just production. It's very common at kind of the, yeah, I guess just like freelance contract level of um, doing production. But I mean, again, like you just starting with, there's nothing wrong with starting with OBS and you can get very, very far with OBS. Um, if you're going to be doing broadcast or observing of any sort, there's definitely the first thing you need to learn. Um, how well you need to understand it depends, but it is kind of where all things lead almost. Yeah, I guess I would second vMix as well on the producing side. I honestly prefer vMix over OBS now just because once you figure out vMix, it feels so simple and everything just works. You don't have to learn like a million plugins like you do on OBS. Um, another software would be like something like voice meter as well, like just learning how to um, change your audio like routing is very good for OBS, especially um, observing. Luckily, OBS has finally added, like, where you can just get only sound from one, like, from your game or whatever, but it's still really good to learn. Also, I don't know if this counts as a tool exactly, and it's kind of topical right now, but I would even say, like, Twitter is a tool that could be useful for people in esports, just because that's just where I think a lot of esports lives. I get a lot of my esports news from there. I don't know what it's going to be like now, especially with all the stuff going on today, but... For me, that's where I've seen a lot of like opportunities, like job postings and just news about the industry is all coming through Twitter. And I just think if you compare it to any other social media, like what Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, like Twitter is where esports lives, whether we like it or not. And I mean, we'll see if that's still the case in the future. But as of right now, that's where I think a lot of esports lives. 
Yeah, yeah and um, I think Twitter also is good for finding some jobs as well. Um, a lot of people will post like if they need people and then it's really good for like if you have your branding on your Twitter and people know what role you do and then they see it come up on Twitter, they can just send it to you. So it's really good to make sure you're branding yourself and using Twitter in that way as well. Yeah, I previously just got a, a role through that, like on Twitter through like what you said. So yeah, that's really applicable. But um, I think uh, Adobe Creative Cloud, if you are a student, um, you'll have ways to get that for free or at least very discounted uh just for any design or video production for like videos or anything like that motion design so adobe creative cloud is really like an industry standard tool for most companies and it's if you're a student yeah it should be free if it's not free ask ask your faculty hopefully they'll give it to you but uh you should get it or with a discount at least and if not if you can't get it for free that way there there are other ways to get it for free <laughs> just ask around i don't know exactly how to do it but uh, ask chat gpt to do it for you <laughs> yeah no they, they won't tell you they won't tell you uh, yeah hopefully through all you know 100 percent legal ways you know oh yeah, internet definitely. you can find whatever actually, you need i have something so something small to add actually is i think for um if you're going to be doing broadcast you're going to knowing some level of photoshop gimp image editing or like graphic design of any sort is just helpful um also, because like when you're starting, you might have to end up doing some of it, uh, especially if you're going to work like collegiate or something or like work in your school's esports club. Like, um, it's something that you should know how to do. You should be able to edit things when you need to. And you sh it's a good idea to have some sort of sense for doing a bit of graphic design. Um, it does help a lot. Yeah, just to add on to that, um, important thing for that is, um, just for, is alignment. Uh, a lot of the times I'll make overlays or a lot of things and some people won't know an alignment so you'll have like one text box here one text box like down here it's a little frustrating to see as a designer but um you know hopefully you, you learn the learn the alignment a little bit and um, it just makes for a better stream overall and so yeah it just makes it look look much nicer yeah and to summarize one of the bigger questions i have for everyone um in your respective fields how do you make something look good so for example if you're observing what makes a really good angle what makes a really good shot or on the contrary what makes a really good graphic or a really good production um i guess i can start with the observing side a lot of observing is storytelling so as long as you are able to portray to the audience what is happening in game what points are important you are showing a good angle eventually you'll learn which fights like if you have two players fighting each other in Valorant for example based on their angle you'll know which person is more likely to win or um, who has the better guns so they're more likely to win that fight so picking the player who has the higher percentage of winning that fight would be the better angle but um, things like using free cam in site ex executions to try to get a bigger picture so that the audience can see all of the utility, all of the fights going on, that helps to create a better um, like picture for that audience as well. Yeah, all observing is is just capturing what is happening and presenting it in a way that is clear. Uh, you're, you're, not, you're not making up anything new you're just trying to highlight the important bits of the game as it's happening and showing them to the audience as clearly as possible so a good shot is anything that shows everything you need and doesn't needs doesn't miss too much uh, sometimes you just miss things sometimes there are two things happening on the opposite sides of the map and there's nothing you can do about it two people died at the same time but it's all about um telling the story of the game as best as you can. And from a replay op perspective, if you're doing replay observing um, of any sort, or just doing, yeah, if you're just taking replays, I guess. Um, it's about highlighting the things that were important from the round or from the thing that just happened, whether it be a fight, a game, a set of a fighting game or whatever. Uh, you just, you're just highlighting the, the cool parts. Um, you can spice it up, add slowdowns, whatever it is that you want. Um, but as long as you're once again like emphasizing uh, the the bits that were important, then you're doing then you're taking a good shot. Yeah, uh, to add on to that, uh, I think it's a really big part uh, is a uh, balance, uh, just visually um, with overlays or streams in general. 
you are always trying to convey information, whether that be through the game or through the graphics, and how, being able to have a balance between, uh, you know, flashy uh, looks or, you know, just actual text information. There needs to always be a balance for something to look natural and to, you know, look good in a sense. Um, and I would say, like, for your broadcast, like, in the in total, like, your complete broadcast, you can always make things better. You can make them a little more spicy, a little more clean. You could always add animations for your transitions, like, little stuff like that. You can always, always improve your broadcast somehow. Maybe you can show your graphics to somebody else and get a second opinion or find a friend who's into uh, graphic design who can maybe help you or give you some pointers and stuff like that. Um, but there's always, always something to improve on, on your stream. It's never going to be perfect, even if uh, you think it's getting close. There's always something you can do to spice it up. Um, yeah, just like look for the, the little things. People will really appreciate the little details. Just, you know, nice animations between scenes and stuff like that. People will, will see that and say, oh, this is not like some amateur broadcast. This is somebody who's put a lot of time and effort into this. And it, it's really apparent when somebody's put like dozens or hundreds of hours into their stream. Yeah, it's amazing to see um, you guys putting so much work into the things you do. And I just want to ask, look, what's your most proud moment of your career? What's the moment that you would want in a documentary, for example? I would say one of my favorite shows I was at was Evo. I was at Evo 2022 last year as part of my as part of Waveform. Um, I think that was definitely the coolest show I was ever at, not just because of the scale and the scope of it, um, but I was also I was also like doing the I was a front of house technical director for the um, conference room main stage, so it was I was watching like some of some of the upper bracket of uh, a lot of the popular fighting games going on at Evo, including like Dragon Ball Fighter Z, which is really cool, um, and then. Uh, I kind of had the opportunity as a result of like being there to also help out with like the arena on the last day. Um, I think overall, just like that show was such a crazy experience, and like it was, it was by far like the highest quality effort I've ever seen. Um, so it's definitely like a highlight of like and like the pinnacle of like what brought the broadcast shows I've ever done. And yeah, that was I think that would be like my favorite moment. Um, for me, I think it would be getting my first chance at a VCT Game Changers North America, because I remember it, it's called Gallerance is where I started out observing, but working in Gallerance and seeing how all of the professional, like, women's and marginalized genders players were, like, growing the scene, and, like, that was kind of, like, my main goal, was to get to a VCT level production and finally hitting game changers and being in lobbies with these players who I've looked up to since like the beginning of Valorant um was pretty amazing it was like kind of like being starstruck but I'm like wait but I also belong here and seeing all the other casts like the casters and hosts who I see on VCT and I'm like they're in the call beside me <laughs> so it's like pretty cool seeing that type of thing I guess I can uh, jump in real quick. I think my uh, one of the proudest moments I had, and I think Jackie, you were actually there, was at uh, the Grubhub feeding frenzy we did, where it was like raining torrentially, and it was like it was looking really bad. Like we had Tyler one double lift all these streamers on the stage, and like the stream was about to get canceled because of the weather. We were actually about to pivot and do League of Legends Wild Rift from the production like uh, little truck. And Jackie and the, other, the rest of the team actually set it up so we could observe that just in case. Luckily, that didn't happen, though. We just did the stream with rain coming down. We had, like, umbrellas. Like, we are holding an umbrella, like, over Tyler 1, stuff like that. But we just made it all come together. And, you know, it was definitely the uh, the most soaked I was for any show. We were all drenched from head to toe in, in water from the rain. But that's definitely a super proud moment because we just made the whole show come together when things were looking really bad. And it was a lot of fun. And there was a lot of great moments from that show, too. Yeah, I remember we were. I remember we pulled it back. I don't remember it being fun yeah. though. <laughs> that, it, that definitely was not fun back, for me. <laughs> looking back, it was fun. It was tough. It was tough, but it was fun. I think. Yeah, that show was uh, almost went That's terribly wrong, one. but yeah, but we that was also the best. Like, 
I think that was also the show that I prepared the most like in game cinematics and like stuff for. So like from an in game directing perspective, that was also really cool for me because that's because like, we, yeah we it's probably the most effort I've ever put into like League of Legends observing. And that really showed, like, we had such a short time to do that show, but, like, Jackie had all these cool animations of the observing, and it, it just looked so polished for such a short and, like, brief show, but it looked, like, super professional. Um, my probably my biggest moment was um, probably joining FaZe Clan as a creative designer. So that was, like, a really big step in my career where I can finally say, hey, I've, I've kind of seen this whole, like, big esports organization grow and, you know, I as they grew, I grew, and just finally joining that, even though I'm currently not with them now anymore, um, just seeing, just ha finally taking that big step into uh, the big leagues, I'd, I'd say, uh, was a big ego, uh, ego boost for me, but also it was a really big learning opportunity for me. Uh, the four months I did work with them was really eye-opening uh, to where, you know, um, I've changed my style a lot from the past, uh, those past four months, and I did learn a lot, and I gained a new mentor there and I'm just really grateful for that opportunity and just being able to grow from that, uh, from that job and, you know, just be better. Yeah, it's amazing. I didn't know that, um, you know, those productions had such a, you know, potential disaster, but luckily you guys averted it with your skills and everything. And yeah, we're going to transition it to our next segment, which is rank dull. So you guys will be guessing the ranks of the following clips and seeing, um, if you guys can get, correctly guess um if these guys are gold plat or bomb tier we'll see what's happening i don't even play valorant <laughs> but i'm i'm gonna try i'm gonna try yeah we'll see how it it's goes. also so hard because like some diamond players play like silver players so true you know, so, so, so sometimes true, i feel like a diamond player <laughs> all right hit us with it Oh, oh, the fuck the safety down here! Cross is not on the ground, so that's a good sign. Good sign. Oh, did they just shoot their own team? Okay, they're teammate. Okay. <laughs> they're online. Yeah, they're right. cooking. They're cooking. Yo, this person is jittery. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> okay. They're okay. So, they're so confident though. They're just running through. Yeah, they're confident. They're, they're on like. How do you feel right now? They're on the They're on Asuna something. high sense though. <laughs> Must be cold in their room. Dang. One enemy remaining. The dash oh, make, pistol make. movement. Okay. Okay. Do you have a default knife that could be a smurf? Aww, to I have yeah, an idea for this one. Oh, they're Vietnamese. Okay. <laughs> what? I'm gonna say diamond. Um, I think plat. I'm I'm hitting a gold. <laughs> I'm gonna say plat. This is this is plat. I gotta join. I gotta join the majority. Hey. Yeah. No. Hey. What? No, 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 no way. way. What? I said gold. Let's go. What he gets a point for being wrong? Because it's like one you get like the price is right. Okay, I see. I'm online. Ahead. Tight angle, kind of. Oh, wait, mm -hmm. that was spicy. How did Brim even get up there? Wait, <laughs> that's what I'm questioning too. Wait, wait. Is this on the new? If it's on the new map, there's a like. Oh, oh, I see. Oh, they I changed it. I haven't played in a while. Oops. <laughs> they changed the map so it's actually playable now. Thank God. Very nice. Yeah, they got some money in the game. <laughs> They're breaded with it, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh, no, that was Wait a minute. <laughs> oh my. Okay. Okay. To be honest, because that Viper didn't play for lineups and just kind of threw it out there, and like the way they're positioning, I'm going to say bronze. 
I was wow. I'm gonna say the same thing. That's what I was thinking too. Uh gold again. Yeah, I'm gonna say gold. It's just like opping for yeah, him. Give me silver. That was good reaction time on that first shot. Yeah, no, the first shot was good. What? What? There's no way. <laughs> you know, this you know, I was leaning. So I was leaning towards diamond. Break. I was gonna say plat. I was leaning towards diamond, and you opened wasn't bronze. Even that good. What? Like, that was because it's so. If you're holding that angle, it's. You just have to look to see when their elbow peaks and then you shoot. Like, that's such a wide angle off of that corner that that op shot's not even that difficult to hit. <laughs> I don't know. I wouldn't have hit that. <laughs> <laughs> Elbozo. <laughs> oh, okay, but yeah, bad. no, that's... No, like, it's not that... Anyway, next clip. Yeah. Oh, it's a clone. Oh, it's the clone. <laughs> I would, I would have shot it. I always shoot that, yeah. Oh, pre-firing. Oh, uh, they're, they're running oh, around. Oh, yo, wait, oh. yo, yo. It's a okay. Call of Duty player for sure. Oh, okay. The continual spraying, no skin. <laughs> I I think that's iron. Yeah. Um, bronze. Yeah, I'm going for bronze too. I will give them a little more credit than iron. I'll, I'll say silver. Put them in iron. What? Oh, Guys, there's no way. Guys, there's no way. Yep. This just proves that everybody is bad, guys. Even oh, if you're, like, no. immortal, everybody's bad. It's just, like, you know what? No offense to them. But that's also their, like, highlight to submit this. That's crazy. <laughs> nice. I'll take it. Waveform stays right. winning. <laughs> yeah, it's great to see everyone's rank and everything. And, uh... Yeah, I think we have room for two more questions, so we'll just ask two really broad questions. And I guess one of the main ones I want to ask is, so, you know, it's kind of like a really broad industry question, is where do you see yourself in the next five to ten years in the esports or gaming industry? Do you think you're going to be still working in the current role, or what do you want to do in the future? Um, I guess I can start. I can see myself doing this freelance for a little bit longer, but um, I'm really hoping that if I stay in esports, it's going to be more in like potentially a health type of role. I don't see myself necessarily continuing on with this, especially with the state of the competitive scene right now for Valorant specifically. Yeah, that's very vague, but I feel like five years in esports is like a century in real life time. I think if I'm going to be in, is involved in esports in some capacity in the future, which I don't know if I for sure will be, but uh, I know like the part of it that I enjoy the most is like the preparation and like coming up with new and cool stuff. Um, so I think I would like to, I think if I was to continue being in esports in like five years, it'd be in some sort of like engineering role uh maybe not necessarily in broadcast but uh either doing something like um prepping documents or prepping uh not documents like working with people to design like the stage or uh figure out logistics like technical logistics like that th those are cool things that i think i would like to be working on on like big projects if i were to be sticking around into five years um but like i also might be branching into something like um game dev or game design or even building like broadcast tools is something i've been looking into so those are kind of what i've been bouncing around with um for my future probably um i don't know being freelance is kind of a, a double-edged sword kind of um just like managing all that work by yourself is kind of hard sometimes and just having your your um 
your income kind of fluctuate is kind of frustrating at some points so maybe uh, it is nice getting an industry job and i do want one but i will i'll see how this freelance stuff kind of rolls out uh, i was a print student so um also maybe uh i was working on some apparel stuff so you know if i can get into that that'd be cool too but uh, yeah um still probably gonna do freelance maybe on the side i don't know about full-time but um hopefully industry job uh fingers crossed but yeah Oh my gosh, I think it's so hard to even think five years in the future. Like five years ago, I, I didn't even think that esports would be in a place like this. But I know for sure in five years, I, I want to keep doing what I'm doing, which is esports broadcasting and telling stories. But specifically, I want to really elevate the Canadian esports scene. Like, I think we just have it so great here in Canada. We have all these major hubs all around Canada. All these, all our big cities have tons of esports going on. We have all these amazing people, like the people on this call. Um, so I just really, really want to keep growing Canadian esports specifically, and I think the best way to do that is to be elevating our, our broadcasts and just showing the world like what Canada has to offer. Like we have great players, great uh, production and broadcast people. Um, but yeah, yeah. I'm follow, kind of following up on that since we still have eight minutes left, we still have another room for another question. So um, kind of. Backtracking, going back to the Canadian aspect, what kind of events would you want to see in Canada happen? You know, we haven't had Worlds here yet. We haven't had um, BCC here yet. What kind of events would you like to see in the future in Canada? All of them. Every <laughs> single big event. We need a League of Legends Worlds. We need a Counter-Strike Major. We need some Valorant. We need Rocket we've League. Robbed. Yeah, we've been, we've we really have been robbed. robbed. Especially we've with League of Legends, robbed. too. Yeah. I, mean, yeah, I, think... I just want LCS to come back here for one more time, you know? Yes. Oh, that was Please. so good. 20, 2017 in Toronto, like, that crowd was just amazing. And we have everything we need. We have the stadiums. We have the, the people to do it. We have the fans, especially. Like, Toronto is a huge city. Like, we could fill out any stadium. And it's a, it's a worldwide hub. We have an international airport. People come to Toronto from all over the world. So I think it's, it's only a matter of time before Canada becomes a a real destination for esports and i think we just got to be patient yeah i definitely see us being able to hold like some higher end valorant tournaments especially just based on the production staff that live in toronto so many people are leaving toronto to go to these vct events to work it's like hello like wouldn't it be a little bit better you'd like have so many people who are here so many like waveform did stuff for um oh my gosh like in chicago last year like hello like you could have those staff members just work in Toronto to set these things up. Um, it's just, we're already, I think we're in a really good place slowly building up with like land tournaments, like um, Toronto Valorant, I'm repping their shirt, but um, they started by building that Valorant scene in Toronto and you could see how fast like these teams are, like they filled up in like two minutes, like all of the spots, spectator tickets like sold out like almost instantaneously, like clearly we have like the hub for that so i think it's just a matter of time and it would be like so successful and uh another thing i want to add too is we don't really even need all these big tournaments to come to, to canada we can just do our own tournaments like we are already doing we have all these great organizations like you mentioned like uh like toronto valor and toronto fortnite all these all these groups in in canada are already doing events and, and doing really cool cool shows and cool spectator experiences so I think we just got to keep doing our own stuff and we have the players, we have the fans. So just, we just got to keep at it. An event that I do actually kind of want to see that I think would be cool is um, like a collegiate or like a sort of like a Canadian esports summit of some sort. Um, like, like this is kind of like the on online version, but it'd be really cool if there was like uh, an event for a day or two where kind of, esports leaders and uh, workers from all over Canada kind of like just met up somewhere and we like ran an event of some sort or just had like a really big social or some gathering. Um, Cause there's a lot of, I have a lot of friends in like other cities, other provinces that I think would be really cool to meet. And um, esports is really is all about the community. Like there's so much that we can learn from each other. Uh, so many things that other people are doing in other places and kind of having like a place where everyone meets would be like really sick. It's actually insane. Like Canada is so embedded in esports, we don't even realize because 
a lot of these people are just behind the scenes and they're not like in the public eye. But if you go to any of these big companies like Riot, Valve, whatever, like there's Canadians in there. So like if we did do a summit like that and if you did get everybody in the same room, which would be pretty tough, but like if you did, like we would just be a huge smorgasbord of all esports, all Canadians doing every kind of job you can imagine. And it's really impressive, especially because of how like small our country is and compared to the 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 US anyways but and that doesn't even that's not even talking about the players too like if you ever look at like some of the NA pros in any game like it's it's disproportionately filled with Canadians i feel like there's always like Americans for sure but there's always a Canadian on like every single roster every top every game has a top player who's Canadian and that just impresses me so much and i think that's why we really have something good going here yeah, uh, apart from like uh, esports, just like looking at casual things, um, you see like the disappearance of a lot of um gaming cons like E3, uh, with publishers kind of switching to online stuff uh, presentations for now. I'd really love to see something like that in Toronto, uh, or Kiss Canada just generally. Uh, you know, we we do have some left like BlizzCon. I'm not sure about any others, but just having like a general gaming convention or show, uh, such as like uh, Summer Game Awards or anything like that would actually, I think, would help uh, esports in general uh, here in Canada a lot, just having those shows and all these companies come out here and they showcase and show some Canadian love. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, that's what CIE is all about here, trying to highlight and showcase the Canadian industry in esports and collegiate, and hopefully we can get something rolling in the future, maybe potentially next year, the year after, but hopefully we can just get that started um, and yeah, the final question and the outro question will be what's next for you guys and where can we find you if you want to find your work and help uh, highlight that? Um, for me, I guess you guys can follow me on Twitter at kill for kill TV. Um, you'll probably catch me in upcoming Valorant tournaments. Most um, next weekend, I'll be doing Soccer Cup producing that. And then there's going to be some other stuff coming up throughout the year so you can find me there if you want to find me on twitter it's just uh my username below uh luigi with an underscore um and then otherwise for the most part i'm not even doing that much freelance anymore uh because a lot of gigs have disappeared from league of legends this year but uh for the most part you can just find me doing a lot of shows and a lot of prep for uh waterloo's broadcast um and just the our esports club in general. So, yeah. Um, you can find me on Twitter at uh, Chuatri with two Ys because someone took it. <laughs> um, for the future, um, I'm probably gonna obviously be doing more freelance work. Um, working with more streamers recently. Um, you might see something in a month or a few months from uh, one of the Sentinels members. Don't say anything. <laughs> but um, yeah, just doing that. Uh, and for me, I just I always just want to keep doing cool esports shows. That's always what I wanted to do is just keep doing the cool shows and whatever I get my hands on, whatever opportunities come my way. Um, but for next for me, you might see me around at uh, at Gommel, Get on My Level, which is going to be uh, this July. It's uh, Toronto's and Canada's biggest Smash tournament. So if you're in Toronto, you should definitely stop by and check it out. Um, but if you want to find me, you can find me on Twitter at Shark Kangaroo. Um, yeah. Yeah, amazing. Thank you all for being part of this panel. It was amazing to hear your stories and get to know, you know, the insight in the industry and what you guys do. And yeah, that wraps it up for us at CAE. This was the final panel. And up next, we have the Valorant Grand, um, finals, I believe it's starting at 6.30 Eastern. And that'll be really hype. We got the final few matches going. And then it'll be the end show for CAE. And happy Canada Day. See you guys later. Happy Canada Day. Thank you so much.